something that we don't do very often this morning. In fact, we only do it twice a year. That's right. Do y'all remember your alabaster boxes this morning? Woohoo! All right. You folks online, uh, if, if, if you didn't bring your box today, uh, you can bring it next Sunday, all right? So uh, we look forward to seeing you. But right now, we're just going to go ahead and do our traditional alabaster march. And we don't even have to have instructions this morning. We can just, we can just kind of bonsai come up and do it. So, uh, thank you very much in advance for your gifts. We appreciate it. Ready to get us go.
Nobody who has attended here from the time COVID hit has come down with COVID because they were here. Isn't that awesome? So thank yes. thank God for that. So we're doing something right. Yep. And thank you for being consistent with masks in and out. Yes. Being cautious. Yes, we're still doing the mask, yeah. at least coming in and going out. And thanks for honoring and observing that.
believe that, right? Amen. Praise the Lord. Yeah, Miss Melba. Wonderful. And he leads me, and I can't even walk without him holding my hand. Just this last week, twice in my driveway, I got turned around and didn't know where I was. I mean, I knew I was in the yard, but I didn't know where. Uh huh. And I just stopped and looked around, and I still couldn't tell exactly where I was. I just said, Well, Lord, I can't walk without you holding my hand. Then I got a glimpse and I knew where I was exactly. I'm just praising you. Amen. 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 Thank you, Melvin. Bless your heart. That's awesome, isn't it? themselves Christians have a desire deep within to be like Jesus to to live according to the Bible but as we read God's Word you know that seems like uh, an almost an impossibility especially when we come across the passages where Scripture calls us to be holy as God is holy and then we come to the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus declared, Be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And so as we read the Word, we begin to wonder, is that life even possible? Is it possible at all for us to live a holy life in this world? And then we look back on how many times we ourselves have fallen short of that ideal and acknowledge that well we are imperfect human beings all of us are and so is that life even possible in this world to be perfect even as our father in heaven is perfect i think sometimes we make the idea of holiness too complex at, at least more complex than it has to be but i believe that if scripture calls us to it that God will enable us to do it. And so in our Bible studies on Thursday night, we're looking at this idea of holiness, of living a holy life. The series is called, There's Gotta Be More. And I invite you to join us as we look at a relevant, practical, and simple understanding of what it means to live a holy life in this world. Please join us. Check your email Thursday afternoon for a Zoom link, and we'll get together Thursday night at 7. We'll see you there.
Well, uh, Melba has just told us that when you pay attention, you recognize the hand of God. I believe that. And, and sometimes we, we're not paying attention. We're distracted by so many other things in our world. Uh, the, the busy schedule, uh, the, the worries and the frets of life, which we're going to talk about here in a, a little bit later. Uh, so we have to pay attention, and, and we also have to make right choices. Because when we make right choices, it, it leads to life. When we make wrong choices, it leads to destruction. You understand that? And so this morning, I wanted to share a little bit of that with you. I, I, I didn't want to reveal that secret quite too soon. Yeah, but guess who's back? <laughs> Hello, Larry. <laughs> I know y'all have missed Larry, and uh, <laughs> he he really wanted to come back and, and see up, see what other ways that he could <laughs> depress you <laughs> or unimpress you. <laughs> and so um, we have Larry here, the orange, and we have two cups, and I'm going to take one cup. And I'm going to put Larry underneath. And Mr. Mark, I want you to pay close attention. Because you're going to have to make a choice. You're going to have to decide which cup Larry is in. And I'm just going to mix them up back and forth like this. You know, you just never know. And so, uh, how's that? You tell me, Mr. Mark, which cup is Larry under? The one, this one here? Oh my. Nice try though. Uh, you wanna try it again? Sure, why not? Okay, all right. We'll mix them up really good this time, all right? All right. Are you really trying to trick me? So I'm gonna say, I think it's left, but I'm gonna say the right. You're gonna say this one again? Oh my, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but nice try. All right. uh, okay. It's actually here. So, but I tell you what, since you are so favored toward this one, I mean, you've chosen it twice. Watch this. Uh, How about that? Wow. So, you know, you're making pretty good choices, I guess, Mark. <laughs> And um, but now the big finale, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to make everything disappear. Wow! Isn't that amazing? And now. Stuck under the cup there. <laughs> and now, I'm going to make the cups disappear. Hmm? How about that, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> Woo! So there you have it. Good job, Larry. Y'all give each other a chest bump. All right. <laughs> I've been waiting to tell you something started with the fisherman. He taught them a new way of life. He turned everything upside down to make it right side up. Forgive seven times? Try 70 times seven, he said. Just be nice? No. Give it all over, whatever is asked of you. Reach over the tracks. Yeah, go to that part of town. <laughs> Cling to the eternal and shake off the chains of this earth. Sin messed everything up. The whole world, but he made it right. Our Father, who is in heaven, holy and honored is your name. Your kingdom, it's come. I'm pledging my life to bring it closer and closer, to show the power of your divine love, to declare deliverance from death and sin to all people, to each race in every language. Making disciples of all nations, 
I'll own my responsibility. Go all in and make it real in my corner of the world. The authority Jesus has already been given. The kingdom that will come on earth as it is in heaven. An everlasting dominion that will never pass because he beat death. Coming as the king of the Jews and finishing it all as the king of the world. His throne and authority are sovereign. You heard right. Forgiveness without boundaries. Hope in all circumstances and a peace that passes understanding. Because death is conquered, eternal life is established. That's why we keep going. Why I keep telling. The Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The root, the offspring. The bright morning star. Baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. From street to street. Nation to nation. He is the King. Power and glory belong to Him. His kingdom will have no end. There's room for you and room for me. Room for everyone who calls on the name of the King. And His name is Jesus. The name above all names. The first and last. The one and only. And He loves you. And He loves you. He loves you. And He loves you. And that is what I've been wanting to tell you. Amen. And somebody you know needs to hear that. And just tell them, hey, there's something I've been meaning to tell you. God loves you. Would you stand as we have prayer this morning? Loving Father, we are grateful again for the privilege of corporate worship, uh, the time when, the, when, when your family comes together Amen. Uh, to lift our voices uh, in praise and adoration to you and, and to share in Christian fellowship together and to get into your word. And I pray, Lord, that you would open your word to us and bless it to our hearts today and empower our lives as we desire to live as Christ-like disciples in our world. Uh, thank you, Lord, for answers to prayer again this week. And, uh, we continue to lift to you the special needs of our church family. Lord, would you bless Ron and, and Greg and Bill this morning and touch them, uh, strengthen them, continue, Lord, to, to bring healing to them. Thank you for your touch on Sandra and uh, uh, your touch on uh, Miss Francis and uh, Amy Nethery this week. And just, Lord, you, you are an awesome, awesome God. Amen. And we love you. And, and we do pay attention, Lord. We try to. <laughs> we see your works every day. And we see how you are working in our lives personally and individually every day. May we not be remiss to say thank you over and over again for who you are to us and the ways that you work in our lives. Lord, I lift Pastor Terry to you this morning as he transitions from uh, his role in the church and uh, just pray, Lord, that you would heal uh, his spirit, O oh God, and heal his body. And uh, just today, Lord, just wrap him up in your arms and let him know that he is a treasure to you and that he is dearly, dearly loved uh, by the God of all creation. And Father, we uh, again pray for our nation and pray healing across our land for the things that divide us. Lord, have mercy on us and cause us to call out to you, the one whose name is great, the one to whose name every tongue will confess, every knee will bow, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Thanks, you can be seated. Courage is persevering through a difficult situation that may scare you. It is important to have courage because you will never take that first step to overcoming the problem if you live in fear. 
I would say courage is having motivation and being proud. I use, I have courage every day, especially when I'm at work. To me, courage means pushing through, uh, you know, tumultuous times, and even in, like, hard times, you know that everything's going to turn out alright as long as you try your hardest and, you know, put your best effort in. Taking risk and being brave, and it's important because it means that I'm strong. So to me, courage is bravery, and when you're brave, you can teach others to be brave. And to me, that means that even people that are really down, or um, you know, that you know don't really know where they're going, as long as they keep their head up, then they can get where they need to be. And we can always look out for other people and help them see where they need to go. To me, having courage means doing the right thing, even when it's hard. And I think that's important because sometimes that courage can have the biggest influence. So did they get it right, you think? Well, we're going to find out over these next, uh, I think, three Sundays uh, as we consider the idea of courage. What does it mean? How do we get it? How do we obtain it or obtain it? Where does it come from? So please pray as, as we approach this series. I think it's very timely for us. Miss Nancy, great to see you. Thanks for being, but we missed you the last couple of weeks. Uh, you know, we're, we're apt to be satisfied with a surface level understanding of ancient writings, such as the Bible. Uh, after all, so much has changed over the centuries, hasn't it? Since those, oh, early, early days. Um, but, but we've, I think we can relate. We can still relate, especially as we look at lessons from Daniel. And I think we can relate to Daniel because of our recent history. On September 11, 2001, our country was under attack. We knew what it felt like to be afraid. We knew what it felt like to know that the enemy is coming to our territory and robbing us of our security and peace. And then there's Afghanistan, the most recent in our history. And all of a sudden, it's out of our hands, it's out of our control, and those who would be our enemy, the Taliban, have come and just kind of taken the whole country over. You may even have a son or daughter or a grandchild or or relative, or close friend at least, uh, serving in our military in one of these foreign lands where there is unrest. So yes, we can relate. We know all about it. And in Daniel 1, we find a record of something that really happened. I mean, it really did happen. And, and it happened to real people. You say, well, that's back in Bible times. They had this, they had this, or they didn't have it. doesn't matter. They were real people. And they were trying to deal with life just as you and I are dealing with life. They had a daily routine. They had families. They had jobs. They went to work every day. Something they were trying to accomplish and they were, just, they were just going through life just like you and me. And then one day, something happened just as it happened for us on 9-11. Something happened that would change their lives forever. One day, King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians laid siege on God's people. Hmm. 
The temple was demolished. The holy city was destroyed. Men, women, and children were killed. And many were taken captive. And Daniel was one of those taken captive. And, and just remember now, he was somebody's son. There was a mom and dad at home wondering what's going to happen to our boy. He was someone's best friend. He had a life and he was robbed of it. We find the story in Daniel chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and sieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Now understand in that day, it wasn't really our president is smarter than your president. It wasn't really our army can beat up your army. <laughs> no, it was our God is stronger and more powerful than your God. And one of the signs of that, and we are given a picture of it here, is that the, vic the, the victorious king would, would take things from the temple of the nation's God and take those items and put it in his own temple or the temple of his God. And that was a symbol. My God is more powerful than yours. Then the king ordered Aspenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring to the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. And he was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians, and the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. And they will be to be trained for three years. And after that, they were to enter into the king's service. And so I know there must have been times, even for young Daniel, that he wondered, God, why are you letting this happen? We are... The holy nation. We are God's chosen. And why are you allowing your people to be overrun and to be held captive and forced to do things they don't want to do? So when we read verse 8, it's a really big deal. This is verse 8. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Wow. You understand that he took his life in his hands at that very second. He could have been struck dead right there. And because of his action, it could also have happened that the other Israelites taken captive could have been struck dead as well. But Daniel resolved to remain true to his convictions no matter what. He, he stayed true to God in an ungodly culture. Why? <laughs> because he never really believed that Nebuchadnezzar was in control. You, you remember Nebuchadnezzar? He's the guy that came in and laid siege on Jerusalem and took things from the temple. And Daniel never really believed Nebuchadnezzar was in control. In fact, Daniel was certain of the sovereignty of God. Amen. And so here we are living in a nation where Christianity is no longer uh, the dominant religion. 
We're living in a culture that gradually has embraced values and, and culture and a worldview that is not necessarily Christian. Well, it's not Christian. And integrity says, courage says, I will not conform. You, you see, when cultural values and scripture collide, scripture must always win. If you are a child of God, if you are his disciple, if you believe this morning that you are indeed, not by head, not by mouth, but by heart, a Christian, anytime scripture and culture collide, scripture must win. And so when we come to define courage, when we gain lessons from Daniel about courage, the first lesson we find is this. Daniel was full of integrity. That takes courage. What does it mean? Integrity means a single-heartedness, a single-mindedness. Ness. When we have it, when we have eternity, eternity. When we have integrity, internal and external things are consistent in us. In other words, what we say we mean, and what we seem to be we are, and and what we talk we walk. That's integrity. It's really very simple. Maybe easier said than done. And maybe the reason for that is that integrity requires courage. It required courage for Daniel to stand up and say, I will not defile my body with your food. Wow. A, a lady once complained and and. This is kind of an older illustration, so some of you may not get it. Some of you aren't old enough. <laughs> but but a lady once complained, you know, I just don't know what this world's coming to. Someone stole all my good Holiday Inn towels from the clothesline. <laughs> we laugh at that. For those of you who are still wondering what we're talking about, she got the towels from Holiday Inn and they in green are written Holiday Inn. It's a, quite a keep say. Uh, I didn't steal towels when I was young. I stole ashtrays. That tells you how young I was. Uh, you know, they actually had ashtrays in the rooms and uh, the ashtray had the hotel's name in it. So, uh, yeah, I confiscated a few uh, back before my... Uh, son, you need to you need to follow Jesus before those days. You know, uh, shame on me. But they're under the blood this morning. Amen. Amen. I don't have to pay for those sins. But you know, we laugh and, uh, until we're reminded of, of the times that our own integrity seems to vanish. You know that when we do a little pencil magic on the tax form at the end of the year. And then, of course, we rationalize it. Well, I'm just trying to find all the breaks I can get. Well, you ought to do it honestly. Or maybe when, when we give our afflicted car a clean bill of health to the person who wants to buy it. <laughs> I'm not lying. As long as they don't ask me if the brakes work, I don't have to say anything. <laughs> or maybe if we become flirtatious with someone who's not our spouse. And we just kind of let, let our integrity fall by the way. Maybe when we offer a creative uh, excuse to the traffic judge in court. Maybe we eat a couple of grapes off the produce stand at the grocery store. They'll never be missed. 
Maybe when we favor one person over another person for a particular task, not based on skill, but based on personal relationship. In all of these instances, our integrity is called into question. And, and it's such a common thing today that a lot of times we, even Christians, don't give it much thought when we fudge here and fudge there a little bit. And so we talk a good game when it comes to right living, but then with, with no warning at all, uh, temptation rears its head, and we're faced with a decision to choose between right and wrong. Or even more, more difficult, to choose between two shades of right. You know what I mean? And, and too often, in making that choice, we choose the road of least resistance. Oh, we're not really sinning. Oh, we're just fudging a little bit. And my, my, how we rationalize the way we have embarrassed our integrity. Today, almost every job seems to come complete with a powerful temptation to hedge on our integrity. Almost every job you have, there's a way to take a, a road of lesser resistance. And we've become so accustomed to it in our society, as I said, that we, we don't even recognize it ourselves when we do it sometimes. John Johnston, uh, a Christian author, wrote this. Because our societal fabric is not woven with strong ethical fibers, those of us with integrity must have a lion's share of moral courage. You see, it takes courage to stay true to your integrity and to your convictions. So is it worth it? Is it, is it worth it to, to fight for this integrity? To take a tougher road just because we want to stand firm on our convictions? Well, here are some reasons I think it's worth it. First of all, it makes us better as individuals. Edgar a guest wrote a poem. How many of y'all like this poetry? I do. You can find it free on uh, Kindle, Kindle, Amazon, whatever. Most of his, his books are free and, and uh, cool. Anyway, uh, he wrote a poem called Myself. And uh, I won't take the time to, to read the entire thing to you, but, but basically he's saying, you know what, at the end of the day, I got to live with me. I've got to look myself in the mirror. I've got to sleep through the night with myself. And I want to be the best self that I can be. If I've got to live with me, <laughs> I want to be the best me that I can. It makes us better individuals when we stand on truth. It, it, it really does. And, and you know what? It's really, we say it's a, a more difficult road, but it's really an easier road. I think it is because when you take a lesser road, when you compromise your integrity, you got to find a way to make up for that. It may even be that in compromising your integrity, you told a lie. Oh, you called it a fib, but I don't care if the, it's a little white lie or a great big old lie. Lies are lies. And now you've got to remember that lie, and you may have to cover it up with another one. It just, you know what, when, when, you, when you stay true to who you are, to your convictions, to who God desires you to be, it's, it's an easier life. 
in the long run. It, it brings peace to you. A second reason I think it's worth it is that it has a ripple effect to those around us. With every deed of integrity, there is an elevation in the level of trust. And the world becomes a better place because you have elevated that trust. And you know, when you, when you tell a lie or you do something that's under the table or questionable, people are going to remember that. And they're going to think twice before they come to you the next time for help or with a confidential piece of information or even asking you to help pray with them about something. But when you practice something that is righteous, they're also going to remember that. And they're going to say, you know, that's somebody that I can count on. And when you prove it a second time and a third time, pretty soon they're going to say, that individual is solid. Well, there's another reason I think it's worth it. It's a form of worship. We, we honor the Lord and reflect His nature when we live with integrity. Amen. That's who He is. And if He has taken up residence in you, that's who you should be. Men and women, and even teenagers and children of integrity. Living upright. Not cutting corners. Not living questionably. But living by the word of truth. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 11 reads. The integrity of the upright guides them. But the unfaithful are destroyed. By their duplicity. Well do you want to be protected? Or do you want to be destroyed? <laughs> it's just, this is a, a real simple choice there, isn't it? Psalm 7, verse 8 reads, Let the Lord judge the peoples. Vindicate me, Lord, according to my integrity, according to my righteousness. And then Proverbs chapter 2. He holds success in store for the upright. He is a shield to those whose walk is blameless. Now, let's go back to Daniel. Daniel, the guy who said, look, I am not going to conform. If I eat the king's food, I will go against what God wants for me. And so I'm asking your permission to skip the king's food and you provide us something different. And, and of course, he said, I, I can't do that. I'll, I'll be put to death if I do that. Daniel said, here's the deal. You continue to feed everybody else from the king's table, but for two weeks, you feed us veggies. Just veggies. You know, there goes that argument for those of you who say, well, God didn't save the plants on the ark. He saved the animals and the meat lover. <laughs> Well, Daniel said, we don't want the meat. We just want the veggies. Two weeks. Now, I thought about that. If you leave here today and you come back in two weeks having gone vegetarian, I probably won't notice much difference in your appearance. I think it's going to take more than a couple of weeks. But we are told here in verse 9, the favor of the Lord was upon Daniel. Amen. You know why? Because he stayed true to his God-given convictions. Because he was a man of integrity. And he, he, he lived the scripture that declares to us God holds success in store for those who live with integrity. He protects those 
with integrity and he destroys those who are living in duplicity. And so, what are some of the reasons that people compromise their integrity? What are some reasons you compromise your integrity? Sometimes it's just downright innocent fun, isn't it? Here's an example. Um, we're going to, you know, after church today, when I, all of us can't go. They, it would be noticeable. But I, I, one of you, Mark, you and I, you and me, you and I, we, we will go over to the Holiday Inn Express. And we'll park over in the back and we'll swim in their pool this afternoon. Won't that be fun? You say, well, that's not going to hurt anybody. What's wrong with that? I do it all the time. <laughs> but I think there's a sign on the gate that clearly says, for hotel guests only. And so you know in your mind, this is wrong what I'm doing. In fact, you already knew it was wrong because you didn't want to take all of us. You just wanted to take one of us so you wouldn't be noticed. Yeah. So sometimes we do it because other Christians are doing it. Right? It doesn't seem right, but, but you know, I saw... Uh, uh, I better not say any names, but anyway. <laughs> I about got myself in trouble. But, you know, I, I saw so-and-so do it. And uh, so, you know, if, if, it must be okay. Well, you know deep in your heart it's not okay. So, number one, you won't call them out. And number two, you're going to take the example and follow them. Uh, maybe, maybe the excuse is it saves the church money or saves you money. You know? and, and after all, your money is God's money. And so you'd be a good steward. If you could do something to save the church money, even if it's a little bit, eh, nudgy, fudgy, uh, you know, it, it'd be a good steward, right? No. Oh. In the final analysis, God doesn't need your money. He needs you to want to give your money. See? Maybe the motive is to achieve acceptance or, or to fulfill a responsibility. And, and, you know, the list can just go on and on. I was reading... A story from a, a pastor and he was talking about, about an escrow account that he had with the bank and uh, it had been something like three years and he got a letter from the bank and he wondered what this was all about and, and they were writing to inform him there are, with apologies uh, that they had overpaid him from the escrow account and he owed them a thousand dollars And he just stiffened up and said, they're not getting my $1,000. It's not my fault they overpaid me, right? It's their fault. It's their mistake. They should have to pay for it. And so I'm, I'm just not going to do it. I'm not even going to respond to this letter. Well, they got another letter. Just in case you didn't get the first one. You owe us a thousand dollars. He said, it's just not right. It's not fair. It isn't just. I didn't make the mistake. They made the mistake. I shouldn't have to pay for it. Have you listened to the reasoning yet? He's not paying for their mistake. He's just giving it back. He's not coming out of his pocket, really. It's money he shouldn't have had in the first place. But, you know, as he continued to think about it and lose sleep over it and, and so forth and so on, he decided that he would rather sleep in peace and give them their money back. Rather, they continue to have his witness question and him question his own 
sincerity and integrity. So if you truly believe in the sovereignty of God, I mean, if you really believe that God is in control of everything, then you won't need to fret over politics, over our government, or the world government. You won't need to fret over COVID. You won't need to fret over your current crisis right now because God is in control. And I want you to know that I just don't think Daniel fretted at all. He may have had some questions in his mind, but he never pointed his finger and said, God, how could you do this to us? He didn't go there. God has never, ever relinquished control of his world. Not even Amen. today. So here's the bottom line. Biblical integrity is essential for our inner peace and for our Christian witness. There is a great little line. I have two quotes now we're finished. Uh, this is from uh, a writer, Jim Eldon. This is good. You may want to write this one down. I like it. Being under the hand of Nebuchadnezzar does not mean that you are out of the hand of God. Right. Did you get it? Yeah. That's right. And being under the uh, oppression of COVID or, or under being living in a culture that is ungodly does not mean that you are no longer in God's hands. Amen. God is in control. It's his world. One more quote. This is Lewis B. Smeeds. No wrong choice can persuade God to love you less. Believe this, and you will have new courage to make choices, even when you're not sure if they are the right ones. Boy, I love that. And so, the first aspect of courage and, and may be the most essential is that we embrace integrity. That we live according to our biblical God-given convictions. As Sarah said on the video, doing what's right even when it's difficult. Amen? Amen. Father, we can't do that in our own power. We know that. We are frail human beings in an imperfect body, living in an imperfect world. And we can't do it without you. And oh God, we need your grace. We need your spirit living in us to empower us in every moment of every hour of every day that we would stand true no matter what. God, would you give us the courage to stand up in the face of evil, to stand up in the face of temptation, and to trust you. I ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. By the way, the first person in that video right before the preaching talking about what is courage, you probably don't remember, she was the, the blonde-haired girl long blonde hair. Uh, that was Maddie, our adopted uh, Trebekah student. And uh, so it was pretty neat to have her, have her on the video with us. This one is uh, sing this song uh, and just, just prayerfully hear the message and uh, take hold of it as God would allow you to. I'm go, yeah, that's all right. <laughs> they say sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some. And right now, right now, I'm losing back. Stood on the stage night after night. Reminding 
the road It'll be alright Right now Right now I just can It's easy to see There's nothing to bring me down But what will I say When I'm held to the flame like I I know you're able, and I know you can Say through the fire with your mighty hand But even if you don't, my hope is you alone Yeah, I was supposed to go down a little bit, why not? <laughs> Let me just do that. They say it only takes a little faith to move the mountain. Good thing, a little faith is all I have right now. God, you choose to leave mountains unmoved. to you we're in your hands and we are determined today we'll serve you when things are going good we'll serve you in the valleys when we're facing the shadows of death even if you don't do what we ask in prayer you will always be our hope yeah. For that, we give you thanks and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, folks, for being with us today. God bless you. Hope you have an awesome afternoon. And we'll see you Tuesday for prayer, Thursday for Bible study, and right here next Sunday. Folks online, God bless you. We love you. <laughs>